Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassnode video report for week 12, 2022. Today we're looking at the concept of volatility pricing and how the derivative markets in futures and options try to price in what could be coming in the future. What we see is that when prices consolidate for, in this case, more than two months in a fairly narrow price range, generally the markets start to relax and they think that the current environment of low volatility is going to be the way it stays. And what we see is that over time, the chance of a high volatility move starts to increase. We're really going to explore this concept of whether we're going to have higher volatility in the immediate future. So as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at both the futures and the options markets and spending a bit of time understanding some of the dynamics about how they start to price in what could happen in the future. Remember, the reality of markets is that nobody knows what is going to happen. What the market's trying to do is price in all the different scenarios. And we see this expressed in futures, options, volatility, and all sorts of metrics like that. Now, simultaneously, we're going to actually explore two interesting concepts. The first one is a geographical view of the buying and selling pressure. So we recently released three metrics looking at the US, EU, and Asian trading hours, and looking at where the buy and sell side is coming from based on price action. So we're going to explore that with a bit of detail and just really map out to start off how 2021 and 2022 have played out so far. And then we're also going to switch over and look at our on-chain activities, a bit of a metric for demand, trying to understand, are we seeing more people coming into the network? How is that recovery going? And some of the real key things to be paying attention to over the coming weeks. So as always, please do give us a share and a subscribe. It really does help people uh, find this channel. Um, as you've seen, we do read your comments. We're going to have a little bit of light mode in the dashboard today, uh, just because it makes it that little bit easier to see. And then we'll switch over to dark mode for some of the more bespoke, larger scale charts. So everybody should win in this particular episode. So here we are in our week on chain 12 dashboard. And what we can see is that price continues to consolidate. We've closed into a very, very small range. We're starting to compress into a little bit of a triangle down here. Now, really the question is, is this somewhat of a bear flag following this very, very large and you know 50% plus correction? Is this a bear flag or is this starting to look a little bit more like bottom formation? Now, as I mentioned, we have to look at lots of pieces of information. There is no one telling for this. And normally after a period of extended consolidation like we've had, typically the market likes to form some form of trend. We typically see these contractions in price that's then followed by an expansion. So it makes sense that the markets will be starting to sense some kind of volatility on the horizon. Now we're looking here at our trend accumulation score, which we'll be keeping up here for all of these week on chains to get a bit of an assessment alongside price, what is the overall view in terms of accumulation? It's quite a nice tool. And just as a quick reminder, these darker purple colors show when we have either lots of whales or lots of, lots of uh, smaller shrimp and fish um, that kind of make up an aggregate whale when we have a large portion of the market adding to their balance. And this is looking at on-chain data. We'll see these purple colors closer to one, which is signaling that there is accumulation going on. Conversely, when we have distribution or a lack of accumulation, we're going to have more yellow colors, and that's going to trade close to a value of zero. And what we can see is that we've had a large period of accumulation, which we're going to touch on shortly in terms of these geographical mappings. But we can see that there was a large amount of accumulation that occurred through the first part of this correction. So all the way through the top, through all the way down to late January. Now, you can see that the 2021 period had lots of periods of light yellow. This is showing that there was very little accumulation, and by and large, it was actually distribution. So what we're seeing is that we don't have that same pattern. There's a bit of an intermix between accumulation and distribution. Kind of looks a little bit more like an uncertainty type period of time. But you can see that we're currently trading at values between 0 0.56, 0 0.53, 0 0.4. So we're getting into values that's not distribution. There's still accumulation going on, although it does reflect the macro uncertainty that's going on. It certainly doesn't look like what we had in this major distribution phase that we had back here in May, June, July. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that downwards is not the direction that this market wants to go next. We have to look at more pieces of information to fill in this circle. So these are some of the metrics that we've released last week. And what it's, it's called the US month over month price change. And we have one for the EU and we have another one for Asia. And we're going to look at these in a workbench chart to just try and clarify. But let me just start off by explaining how these metrics are constructed. And then we can start to compare their market structure. 
So what the US month over month change looks at, it, we divide the overall working day, because Bitcoin is a global asset, into three eight hour chunks that represent the main trading hours of those particular geographic regions. Now within that eight hour chunk, we do a cumulative sum over the last 30 days. So think about the last 30 days of trading history, take US trading hours only, and look at how much the price changed either up or down over that period of time. Now, when we have a large amount of upside, we're seeing more and more of those candles inside US trading hours going green and actually trading higher, we will get these large green zones. It's showing that most of the positive price appreciation was occurring during US hours. And we can see that the US had both US and EU had a large amount of buying pressure in the first part of the 2021 bull. Now, as you would expect, when there's more sell side, we see that we get these red candles that's showing that more of the downside price action was occurring within US, EU, or Asian trading hours. So let's jump across to our workbench chart. And this is where I've actually plotted all of those out together. So we can actually start to tell a bit more of a cohesive story and see how they behave relative to each other. Now, what I'm going to turn off the Asian hours just for now and we can see that Europe, which is in purple, and US, which is in blue, have a relatively similar pattern. They seem to follow suit. They, they are uh, more or less acting in the same way. So following our March 2020 sell-off back here when monetary policy and everyone kind of woke up to Bitcoin being a macro asset, notice how we had a large amount of buy side. Lots of the positive price action was going on during US and European trading hours. And then as we came through September, we saw a massive influx and we can see January, the US really overtook as the dominant buy side in the market. Now, as we moved into the topping pattern, we can see that US in the background here started to cool off a little bit and actually European trading hours really dominated the buy side. So Europeans came in slightly later in terms of that trend, although that was certainly a large part of the early phase of the bull. So you can see when you have this huge amount of buy side coming in, in you know, two out of the three trading hours, we're going to see that there was a massive amount of price appreciation. Now, during the capitulation phase, note that the US, after such a massive amount of accumulation on the way up, was also responsible for a very large amount of the sell side during that first capitulation week. Now, what we can then see is that Europe moved into a distribution period through most of the time through May through to July, but the US actually started accumulating early into that trend and really peaked yet again here in August, putting in this first top. Now, note that the buy side really did decrease. There was a lot less going on during US hours as we came into the current all-time high, first in October and then again in November. At the moment, we have even less buy side, but it does make sense as we're getting prices correcting, there's less interest in the asset. At the moment, we still have buy support from both the US and Europe, but just note that it doesn't look like this full scale bull that we saw back here in 2021. So it shows that we're not out of the woods yet, even though there is positive price appreciation going on within those 16 hours of the trading day. So now what we're going to do, we're going to change these. We've actually just introduced a bar and a line style chart to these. So we're going to actually look at these and turn off the European ones to a line chart, US to a line chart. This is just so we can see them as almost ghost traces in the background. And we're now going to introduce the Asian trading hours. So just see how it differs across different parts of the world. And we can see that where the US and the EU was in accumulation following March 2020, interestingly, Asian trading hours were in distribution. And maybe this reflects a different view of the impact that COVID was going to have on the global economy. There could actually be a difference in opinion in how Bitcoin actually fell into that picture. And likewise, through most of the 2021 bull, note that the Asian trading hours really didn't pick up. There wasn't much participation, particularly relative to the US and the EU. So we can see that there was slightly less participation going on. There's a little bit more trading style, buying dips and selling rallies. There was a little bit more activity going on on that front. But really, there wasn't the same scale of mass accumulation that we saw coming from Western markets. Now, note that during the, the current all-time high in October and November, everybody bought the top. We can see that there was a large amount of buying both from across all three regions. And it kind of shows that there was that participation going on during that time. It was a broad scale. We're going up to the 100,000 level. And we can see that that was really the top as everybody believed that it would keep going and that there was nothing that anyone could do about it. 
Now, interestingly, as we've seen the US and European markets kind of oscillating, but generally being more on the buy side during this correction, note that Asian markets have been more or less in distribution. Most of the downside price action has been occurring within their trading hours. So it, again, it's just kind of painting this interesting picture about how geographical markets can be different over time and how Bitcoin can more or less respond and understand what's going on around the world, being that global asset that it is. So we're now shifting across to look at the on-chain side of the equation. We're going to look at this from a couple of angles. The first one is going to be the on-chain activity. Now, when I talk about activity, I mean things like the number of active addresses, new entities coming in on-chain, number of transactions, and transaction volumes. These kind of capture a large portion of what's going on in the market. And really what we, we can typically see with all of these is the full-scale bull we have growing entities coming in on chain, we have more active addresses, and we have a large number of transactions. It makes sense when the market is hot and we see lots and lots of uh, accumulation going on. Everybody knows somebody who's getting rich off Bitcoin. The media loves a good story when Bitcoin's going through its rally. We see more people coming in and thus more activity on chain. So it's typically a fairly good metric to just keep in track of whereabouts we are in that bullish cycle. Now, just the same way that growth in these metrics shows that there is a bullish trend in play, we see a decline in these metrics, particularly as we topped out through March and into, uh, into May, we started to see weakness across this growth in people coming into the network. So really, this is somewhat of a bearish divergence. We can see it here in the number of transactions. We can see a stagnation in the number of active addresses. So overall, we're seeing that there was a slowdown through that topping pattern, which then resulted in a major collapse following the May, June, and July bear period. And this really has been so far the worst of that in terms of the overall activity metrics. We see that they collapse quite severely. And since that point have been in somewhat of an ascent, they've been slowly growing and coming back to life. So what we have seen is that during the rally that pushed up to all-time high, we saw an influx of new users. We saw our activity start to build up, and this is constructive. This is good. It's what we want to see. But note that since that point, during this correction, we've more or less traded sideways to slightly down across almost all of these metrics. Now, what that's telling us is that we have what I would call a stable base. This feels to me like the hodlers. The only people who remain are people who don't particularly care that much about a 50% drawdown because maybe they've seen it before, maybe they're more experienced, or maybe they simply believe in Bitcoin as the asset. But what we are simply not seeing is an influx of new users. We're not seeing those additional people coming inside. And really, that's somewhat of a more bearish signal. So we've kind of got this interesting market where price is trading sideways. It's kind of only the hodlers that remain, which is quite impressive that they've held these prices, given the macro uh, back, uh, outlook that we have ahead of us. But at the same time, we are not seeing yet an influx of new users. So it's kind of a bit of a scale that we need to just pay attention to what comes next. If we see a very significant break higher in these metrics, or we see a significant break lower, that would be a more bullish and a more bearish uh, case respectively. So these are some metrics to just be paying attention to over the coming weeks. Now, one metric that is quite different, actually, is the total transfer volume. And I'm looking at this as on an entity-adjusted basis, which is trying to remove all the internal transfers by exchanges and things like that. So it's a much cleaner signal. Now, what we saw after the 2017 top is that our transaction volume peaked and then completely blew up. So all of the users who came into the network pushed us up to $20,000 were essentially removed from the market almost immediately after that. And at that time, we had about 30% at most of large-scale transactions. These are the $1 million plus sizes. Now, in our current market, note that we've had our peak through the March, uh, March through to May period. We had a similar collapse to our activity metrics in volume, but note that we didn't correct all the way back down to pre-bull levels. And in fact, we've started to set these kind of higher levels. We're seeing more transaction volume, more settlement volume in this higher range. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is that of this transaction activity, something between 60% and 70%, so more than double what we had back in 2017, are $1 million plus. So we do, in fact, have a larger proportion of institutional scale capital. So it's showing that um, even within the context of a slower economic environment, we have seen that kind of bearish trend overall. If you look at the absolute magnitude of active addresses, entities, transactions, and volume, it speaks to a bear market. 
What we haven't seen, however, is kind of the trend of complete collapse. More people are still in the network. Many of them appear to be hodlers. So it's kind of this interesting balance of it's it's not the worst thing in the world. It's also not the best thing in the world, which kind of explains why we're trading sideways. At the moment, the market doesn't really have that much of a direction at this point in time. So certainly I'm paying attention to all three of these, all four of these metrics, sorry, looking for do we get a sustained break higher or lower being a positive or a negative sign respectively. Now, when we move across to the supply dynamics, just before we jump into derivatives, what we like to look at is the long-term holder supply. Now, long-term holder supply is the cohort of coins that are older than 155 days, about five months. Now, statistically speaking, when we analyze the chain, coins that are dormant and have been dormant for a long time are more likely to stay so. It's showing that there's kind of a conviction. These are people who have seen lots of volatility. They've been through Bitcoin cycles and they're probably more experienced. They are more likely to stick around. Now, you can see that long-term holder supply has stagnated over the last couple of months. Now, remember that it, because it's a 155-day cutoff, it's going to take time for coins to actually get to that age, even when accumulation is going on. So that's where we jump across to something like the total supply last active three to six months. Now, this is actually one of the HODL wave bands for people who've been using the HODL waves. This is essentially extracting all those coins that are within that three to six month band. Now, what I like to do is when we get to three months, they're coins that have seen some volatility. In fact, coins that are three months old have seen all of this drawdown. So they're people who are familiar with the fact that we're probably in a bear market. So again, it's one of those things that the, the people who hold these coins are a little bit more likely to make it to that end zone of getting to a long-term holder status. And we can see that this jump here from the actual lows that we set back here in uh, late January, we've seen about 480,000 coins on this rise. So it's showing that of the coins that were accumulated up through this zone, which let's just jump back to our accumulation score, that's these coins. We can see all of these that were accumulated in the first part of this drawdown are now maturing into that three to six month old band. Now remember the long-term holder status is inside here at about five months. So we're seeing that kind of impulse of accumulation that has already happened. Now this is not quite as big as what we saw post-March 2020, which is about 510,000 coins. This is 480,000. Now it's a large amount on paper, but it's also nothing like what we've seen here. This is the result of the bull market coins that were accumulated. And this was over 1.1 million coins. So a much, much larger impulse. So kind of, it's not dissimilar to our on-chain activity. The supply dynamics are there, but they're not the strongest that they've ever been. So it's again, one of these metrics we want to be paying attention to. Do we see further influx? What we want to see for more constructive prices is this hollow wave band continue to climb, hold away, um, the long-term holder supply continue to climb. And what we really don't want to see is either of those turning down in a very serious way. And so almost a lot, if there's something to take away from this to be paying attention to, it's do we see an uptick or a downtick in our on-chain activity and in particular in our three to six month old band. We really do want to see that starting to tick higher, showing that more accumulation is going on. People are hanging onto their coins and they might make it to that end zone of being a long-term holder. So now we're going to transition across to the derivative space. And this is where we're trying to understand what is the market pricing into the future. And remember, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. All we can do is use the tools at our disposal to understand more about it. Now, what we can see in our futures term structure, this is looking at the pricing of futures that have an expiry date. We have them out to April, out here to June, and then again out to October, and then another one right out to year's end in December. Now, when the curve is flat or trending down, that's what we call backwardation. And that's showing that the market is expecting a lot of risk. They're not expecting many much price appreciation in the near term. And overall, the magnitude of this, I mean, we're trading here at 41,000. And here we are at 42,500 out to year's end. It's not a very big premium. So the market's not really pricing in Bitcoin having a fantastic year at this point in time. Now, on top of that, we look at our options at the money implied volatility. This, this metric will trend higher when the market is expecting a lot of volatility. Now, the red curve is our short term. So if we expect volatility in the next week, this metric will be much, much higher. The green line here is our six month out. So looking out roughly towards um, uh, uh, three quarters through the year. And you can see it's a lot more stable. The market is better at pricing in some of those risks in the longer term, whereas our short term is very volatile because every candle changes the market's perception. 
Now, what we can see is that our implied volatility right now is at a very, very low level. We're coming off these levels of 60%, 70%. And historically, we've seen this at the top. And you can think about this. The market didn't expect the downside volatility in May. The market thought everything was rosy and everything would just keep trending higher. Everything was all good. So we saw that we had a very low period of implied volatility. We can also see that we had lower levels down here during these dips. The market wasn't expecting these higher volatility moves. Now, we've started climbing a little bit, even though the market is trading sideways, which generally should compress that volatility. With all of the macro environment that's going on and all the geopolitical risks, the market is starting to price in a little bit more volatility. Now, if we then jump across to our perpetual funding rate and our annual annualized rolling basis on a three-month term. Now, these are a bit complex. Let me explore what these mean. So we have two types of futures in the Bitcoin space. We have what we call expiring futures, which means it will expire on the 30th of September, and the price will close into that particular level. And any premium that we can see in this futures curve, so let's take the, the uh, September uh, contracts here, they're currently trading at $42,000. So if someone was to buy spot and sell the future, they would be able to lock in roughly a $1,000 premium over that period of time. So that's what we call the annualized rolling basis. And we're looking at it on a three-month basis. So if someone was to sell the, the three-month contract and buy spot, this is called a cash and carry trade, they would essentially capture whatever the premium is there. And then when the contract expires, they would do it again. They would sell the next future three months out and rinse, repeat the cycle. So they can essentially take on a risk-free premium. They're essentially taking premium out of the market. And as a result of that, there's a demand for spot, but there's also a sale for the future. So it's kind of this balancing equilibrium. Now, the funding rate is something that's only associated with our perpetual futures. These are futures that never expire. Now, as a result, how do they keep the overall market price and the futures price if it never expires and there's a contract that closes at the end? They use the funding rate, which is kind of a dynamic version of that. It changes based on how, far, how much leverage is in the system and how far traders are pushing price away from the spot level. So the way to think about this, it's almost the interest rate that must be paid in order to take on leverage. That's the way to think about the perpetual funding rate, whereas the um, rolling basis is using those futures that actually expire. Now, we're going to jump across to a workbench chart now. And this is where I've actually mapped both of these out next to each other on an annual basis. So you can think about this if you were a market maker and you were starting to, trying to get some kind of yield out of the derivatives market, these are the types of tools that you would use. So we can see that the blue curve is our three month annual basis. You can see it's much less volatile than our perpetual, which is in the red. And note that the red, the red curve or the pink curve peaks at bull market tops. It peaks at bull market tops because people are willing to pay the maximum amount. They're paying a huge interest rate. Some of these are over 100% annualized for the privilege of taking on leverage. So people are literally buying the top with leverage, which as you've probably seen, creates the top and then we get the sell off. Note how our perpetual futures curve then drops back to the more stable and kind of better priced in expiring future. So as that leverage gets flushed out of the system, people capitulate out of the space, and then we see that the pattern more or less rinse repeats. Now, during this bear market period, note that we are currently trading in a very, very similar manner to what we were during May, June, and July. It's showing that people were more willing to go short and take leverage to push the perpetual futures below what the yield you could otherwise get from the three-month basis. And likewise, we've been in this regime for an extended period of time, although it's starting to break back above, which again is starting to indicate perhaps there's a regime change in the way that the market structure is playing out. We may see a change occurring in the near term if we do get a break above, as we saw here in August, and then again in the October and November all-time high. So we can see that people are more willing to put this leverage onto those overall contracts in perpetual markets. We're seeing that a large portion of the overall premium has been squeezed out of the market. There's lots and lots of traders in these cash and carry risk neutral trades. And generally speaking, let's actually jump back to our dashboard. We can see that periods where the annual basis is very low, like back here in September 2020, back here in July 2021, here in September 2021, and in our current position, all of these have been followed by a massive 
not necessarily to the upside, but a massive impulse, a period of very, very high volatility. So it is showing that we're kind of, we've gone through this process where the market has squeezed out all of the premium. And generally speaking, we see that this is a time when volatility is likely around the corner. And just to close out this session, we've seen through 2021 that kind of the fire that often ignites some of these volatile moves is a leverage or a deleveraging, a flush out of people who have too much leverage on the table. And what we have is two charts here priced in BTC to help spot those deleveraging events, these big sharp downturns. We have our futures open interest in perpetual markets and futures open interest in all markets, which is expiring and perpetual. Now, the way to think about this chart is when we have these very high levels, particularly in the perpetual market, you can see that we've been in this gradual uptrend as the market prefers this instrument. And we can see that we are at high levels. There is a lot of leverage in the system right now. It's about 1.3% of the market cap is currently held in perpetual futures. So it's a very, very significant amount. And it is in what we would consider to be the hot zone. It is likely that we could get some kind of deleveraging event. And simultaneously, our futures open interest is not as high, so there's not as much leverage in the expiring contracts, but it is certainly approaching high levels. It's almost 2% of the market cap overall. So we do have a preference for traders being in these perpetual markets. There is a lot of leverage in the system right now, and our markets are also predicting some kind of high volatility event based on past performance. So what we could expect in the near term is some kind of high volatility move, and it, it makes sense to be paying attention to our on-chain activity to see whether the bulls are coming in, are we seeing more activity coming to the table, or is it just still slowing down and we're not seeing that bid support coming in. So it could be a big move. It's very, very hard to tell which way it will go, especially in this macro environment. But at least now we have a toolkit to be paying attention to just in case something moves. So thank you for tuning in, everyone. Please do give us a subscribe and a share if you enjoyed this content. This was a little bit more challenging considering the derivatives market. So I understand if this was a little bit more complex, if you do have questions, remember, you can always stick them in the comments and we will get around to answering them whenever you can. So just to kind of summarize what we've seen this week, on-chain activity is a little bit lackluster. It really does describe a hodler-dominated market. We do want to see that influx of new users, more settlement volume, and more people coming into the network. Often it requires some kind of a catalyst, and often the best catalyst for that typically is price going up. Now, on the same time, the yields that are available in cash and carry style trades in derivatives markets have been squeezed very, very low. It shows that during this downtrend, and this is across all markets, not just Bitcoin, a lot of traders are taking on that risk neutral cash and carry trade, and that's squeezing down the premiums. And historically speaking, that's typically Tinder for some kind of large move. And again, it's quite challenging to understand which direction it may go, and it really could go in either direction. We do have all of the elements in play for a high volatility regime around the corner. So certainly be paying attention to this, and we will catch you in our Friday's video. Cheers.